Uh, but it is true that most uh, people with uh, borderline disorder, uh, most adult studies, have found that uh, most no longer meet criteria after several years. Uh, as I'm sure you are fully aware, there is a, a very, uh, uh, historically, there's been a very high risk of suicide in uh, adult borderline patients. Uh, the impaired function continues on average, although uh, maybe not with a uh, severity, we trust not, uh, when they were mostly hospitalized. And uh, comorbid personality disorder in the initial assessment or follow-up is associated with poorer function. Uh, but in the general population, we have uh, many fewer studies. There are two major studies employed, substantial samples of college students screened and subsequently diagnosed positively for borderline disorder. They were each reassessed after two or more years. Uh, both, uh, but these are this general population. These general population studies were actually college samples, and uh, Mark Lenzenwanger did a study of Cornell students, and uh, Timothy Truel. Uh, uh, I've forgotten now the uh, university. Uh, uh, in any case, and what those two studies indicated about long-term outcome uh, was that as uh, is true, I'm sure, uh, in patient populations as well. Uh, symptom levels fluctuate over time. Recovery to symptom levels below the diagnostic uh, level is, is common, uh, but uh, borderline disorder seems to have more lingering negative prognosis than most other personality disorders. But those are, as I say, relatively uh, short-term uh, follow-ups, and as uh, Mary Zanarini is going to talk to you uh, later about, I think, uh, both the collaborative stu study and her McLean study have shown that uh, 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 personal, uh, uh, this, is, this is relevant to, to the issue of, of whether we can measure these uh, disorders in general populations and predictive of the future as full diagnostic assessments. And this study has also, the collaborative study, suggested that some borderline diagnostic criteria may also elicit a sex bias in the tendency to make this clinical diagnosis. And that is uh, uh, those two uh, 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 findings from clinical studies are important contributions to our feeling that uh, our findings based on uh, self and mother report uh, in our studies, uh, and uh, our also our finding of about an equal rate of borderline personality disorder in males and females may be actually uh, uh, true. Uh, both uh, for, to go back to the uh, previous uh, studies that I mentioned, Lenz and Wenger and Truls, both studies found higher rates of subsequent academic and social problems over uh, two or more years. A follow-up of child and adolescent patients, uh, there are uh, three studies that have uh, been done in the last, uh, well, now we're nearing two decades. Uh, and uh, for these patients with borderline diagnosis or syndrome, most no longer met uh, criteria on follow-up. There were some suicide or suicide attempts. There were many different diagnoses at follow-up, very impaired. Often they remained inpatient or in, in uh, group quarters. And generally, these uh, uh, very impaired uh, pre uh, predominantly uh, adolescents, child or adolescent patients, were predominantly males at the initial assessment. So that's some, uh, some of the facts about what we knew from uh, clinical samples that are uh, uh, sort of important to keep in mind, I think. Uh, relevant studies of borderline traits or symptoms in children or children are sparse. And you heard from uh, Nikki Crick. I think her group is by far the main group studying these issues in 
uh, uh, non-diagnostic samples in younger children. Uh, that's, of course, because uh, many diagnostic criteria are difficult to measure prior to adolescence. And um, until very recently, there was no structured or semi-structured assessment designed for borderline disorder in children. Uh, but as, I, as uh, Nikki described to you, her, her line of uh, work has found that there are uh, certainly at least elements of the borderline diagnosis that can be assessed earlier in childhood. And uh, she has several publications, some honestly I didn't know about uh, until yesterday. But I, uh, it is a, a wonderful line of work. I hope uh, that uh, we may yet have some influence on uh, the uh, a national research community in, in mental illness in, uh, I, I think it's, it, this is a, is a very important disorder. We need to understand it. Uh, uh, so the, the only uh, full assessment of borderline disorder criteria from pre-adolescence is the study I'm going to be describing to you, the Children in the Community General Population Cohort studied from early childhood to current data being collected at average age 38. So in some borderline trait indicators, such as relational aggression and friend exclusivity, are fairly stable over at least short year period, even in pre-teens. And a decline in symptoms with age is normative throughout adolescent and adolescence and early adulthood. That may be, I hope, encouraging to all of you. So the study I will be describing is uh, one I've been engaged in for a very long time. Uh, I have been uh, supported by uh, the, uh, the uh, National Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the National Child Health and Human Development, the National Institute of Justice, and the W.T. Grant Foundation over these uh, now uh, getting, uh, actually, it's now 25 years. Uh, this, uh, no study like this is done by uh, any one person. And we, although we've had some variations in the team over, over time, I uh, uh, want to particularly note my field director, Claudia Hardmark, who's been with the study, actually, uh, since its inception before I had the data uh, in 1975. And uh, my wonderful group of uh, current and past uh, collaborators um, now uh, uh, still uh, active uh, is this relatively large group, uh, most of whom are not on, my, uh, on the payroll of this having had the cuts that other NIMH uh, grants also have uh, experienced. Uh, and, but I am happy to say we're also now, uh, I'll talk to you maybe a little bit about the collaboration we're doing with some of the uh, intramural uh, NIMH researchers. So this is a sample that was originally uh, uh, collected, a random sample of people living in 100 randomly sampled block groups or, or tracts uh, in Albany and Saratoga counties in uh, upstate New York. Now, the original uh, investigator, um, uh, Kogan, uh, Leonard Kogan from City University and Shirley Jenkins from uh, Columbia University School of Social Work, uh, did this study of uh, children on the average age five, ranging from one to 10, uh, uh, based on a random sample of families in those uh, two co counties, in those t 100 areas within those counties. Because they were, at that time, considered by market researchers and uh, social researchers to be pretty much representative of the United States population. Now, the United States population has changed a lot since that time, so there are no Hispanics in this sample, for example. Uh, but uh, it is otherwise 
rural, uh, suburban, urban, and dense urban. Uh, uh, it is has about the same proportion, which is about 10 percent, uh, of uh, 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 black um, uh, Americans uh, that the general population has. Uh, but uh, now, as I say, since that time, we have uh, more immigrant groups. Um, so, uh, so that it's not so current population of uh, at that age would be somewhat different. We have assessed all Axis one and Axis two disorders uh, at four times. We're actually almost almost getting near the end of the fifth time now. Uh, from uh, starting when they were ages 9 to 18. This cohort was born uh, on average in 1970. Uh, they were born actually because they were 1 to 10. They were uh, between uh, late 64 and early 74. Uh, we uh, assessed those with interviews of the children and of the mothers. Uh, and those four have, uh, as I say, uh, uh, the mothers, uh, we stopped getting diagnostic information, although we have continued to study the mothers uh, when these were uh, young adults, and we felt they no longer were all that clear about what their uh, children's problems might be. Uh, uh, we have uh, had clinical diagnoses only in the last two uh, assessments. Uh, before that, we were uh, relying entirely on uh, algorithms um, uh, conforming to the uh, DSM and uh, used the uh, diagnostic inter interview uh, schedule for children uh, that was uh, for the Axis I disorders. The, uh, since there was no such in a thing as an instrument, uh, I invented one. Actually, I went to my colleagues and looking for something to assess in children, and they laughed at me and they said, "You can't assess these things in uh, at that age." And so I didn't tell anybody I was assessing any that at that age. I uh, used the uh, Heiler's uh, PDQ as a sort of a basis for what kinds of questions to ask. Uh, modified it as necessary to uh, ask uh, about age-appropriate uh, 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 symptoms or manifestations of symptoms uh, and uh, adapted, uh, wrote new items when I thought you couldn't do it from old uh, assessments. Um, just sort of to preview a little, we didn't know, uh, of course, uh, and this is in general, uh, as I'm sure many of you uh, clinicians know, a problem that we, whether mothers or children are going to be better uh, informants about disorders is always an issue. Uh, and I think the bottom line is it depends on which mother and which child. Uh, and uh, that's at least the best research evidence I've seen. Uh, we, had, uh, we used both informants for, uh, for, as I say, for both Axis I and Axis II disorders. But uh, we have found for personality disorders, actually, we found the adolescents were better in uh, predictors of long-term outcome. And uh, so much of what I'll be reporting on today, although many of our publications showing effects of adolescent uh, personality disorders, are based on combined reports. Uh, the, uh, some of what I will be talking about today are based on the adolescent reports, which seem to be better, as I say, for long-term uh, prognosis. We also, by the way, have studied offspring, siblings. You know, uh, we have a number of, uh, of uh, studies that have, have uh, sort of grown out of this one. First of all, let me say this is a very different study than the ones that you've been listening to all uh, this uh, weekend because this is a general population. These are not patients. And, you know, there's nothing like doing a study like this to make a person appreciate how few of the people with problems get help. Uh, 
it is really uh, kind of shocking to me how few of these people have had certainly I mean not only not uh, not the uh, more um, intensive uh, treatments that you have been talking about but even relatively uh, modest ones particularly when they were adolescents um, now on the other hand although we have a lot of data on what services they did get we have written too little about that. I'm still looking for particularly postdocs uh, or, or pre-docs who are interested in studying those issues, uh, which I think are, are still to be uh, looked at. Any case, what you see here, this is, uh, these are not uh, talking uh, a, a selection of uh, symptom variations over the multiple assessments of the, uh, those who had uh, the disorder, but just a random sample from my population. So you understand that no matter what disorder we're talking about, symptoms go up and down over time. And uh, so that that's uh, something that it's important to appreciate. It's not only happening in the people with disorders, but it happens uh, that co people come in and out of these uh, problems over time. I have a, a little influence of my uh, statistical background as best I can. I'm going to give you standardized uh, uh, estimates of effect sizes. This is just to give you a little sort of orientation. Something under uh, 0.2 is a relatively small effect. By, uh, 2.2 to say 0.3 is a medium. Anything bigger than 0.3 is a a large effect in terms of what we usually find in psychological studies. So borderline disorder, one of the things that, uh, that we can say about the symptoms is they diminish with age. Uh, in fact, uh, I wish I could tell you now what's happening in our oldest cohort, that uh, our current ones, that's going beyond uh, 40, because we may find a leveling off there. But uh, we found that actually uh, uh, we do not find, despite the fact all these, uh, uh, the large sample, which I guess I forgot to say, is uh, about 800. Uh, uh, and uh, that we uh, do not find uh, very uh, diminishing, clearly diminishing uh, decline in the symptoms with time. So over, over this period of time, uh, the uh, symptoms have gone uh, down about, uh, well, it's a large effect from, uh, let's say, from our estimates at age 10, which was sort of the youngest people, to age 40 is, uh, is uh, over half uh, a standard deviation. And it's linear, by the way. Uh, we, uh, uh, one of the another things I have to just say, now that you know I'm also a statistician, uh, that uh, one of the uh, wonderful things about doing longitudinal studies is that you find that there's a lot of statistical power. So if things are curvilinear, you usually find it. Uh, the, uh, correlation of self-reported symptoms over time over our multiple assessments were uh, um, what I would call comfortably large. They're not huge. These uh, problems are not, uh, you know, uh, a big, you know, you have it or you don't. Uh, that's, uh, but the uh, symptom uh, persistence over time uh, is, is uh, pretty substantial. Uh, when you th when you think about you know talking about twenty years, so they're uh, quite large within adolescence, but they are also quite large when we're looking at from the early adult, the age twenty two, average age twenty two, to uh, to what we're having trouble finding. If somebody has a suggestion. We call this uh, average age 33 full adult, or is that insulting to the late 20s? <laughs> uh, and what do we call those who are five years older now? Uh, borderline disorder, uh, and not surprisingly, in early adolescence predicts later borderline disorder. Uh, uh, in 
this is for those actually meeting the diagnostic criteria. I sh uh, as, I, uh, as I showed you, the symptoms fluctuate a lot, and that means that for those of us who study these, we'd rather talk about symptoms than the diagnostic level, uh, even appreciating that the diagnostic level has an important clinical significance. But, uh, so a lot of what I show you uh, would be uh, symptom relationships. But uh, here in the transition years, the odds uh, of having uh, a borderline disorder, if you had had in your early adolescent assessment uh, about 10 years earlier, are uh, in increased 11 and a half times. Uh, and in the, this is now 20 years later, they are increased five and a half times. It's also very clear that comorbidity among the disorders in and across the DSM axes is rampant in both clinical samples and in population samples. The long-term prognosis, this is a, an article that we uh, published in the archives uh, earlier uh, this year. Long-term prognosis of axis one and axis two disorders are of comparable magnitude and often additive when comorbid. That was actually a shock to me to see that they would be so nearly additive uh, <coughs> when we first looked at this. And this is over 20 years we're talking about. Uh, I, um, here we were looking not at borderline disorder all by itself. We were looking at the uh, personality disorders and the axis one disorders <coughs> for which there is uh, each set of disorders in adolescence and I think maybe uh, thereafter as well, but we haven't done a full investigation of that, has about uh, a 50 percent overlap. That is, in the, at least in the general population, and probably much higher in uh, patient populations. About half of those who met the criteria for any axis one disorder also had at least one axis two disorder, and vice versa. So our current work, uh, we, uh, one of the things that we're really looking on now is, co at, is comorbidity. And two disorders that have shown comorbidity with borderline disorder in clinical samples are attention deficit disorder and bipolar disorder. And these are clinical, and these disorders are also attention deficit, of course, in, in clinical samples of children and a bipolar in clinical samples of adults. These disorders are also comorbid with borderline disorder in our cohort. I, the CIC is children in the community cohort. This work may lead to better understanding of the basic and shared biological components of these disorders, and that's something we're really uh, going into uh, now. Uh, I'm happy to say that we're doing a collabor uh, collaboration with uh, the NIMH uh, intramural program with uh, Danny Pine and his group. He was a, kind of a protege of mine when he was at Columbia and uh, now heads up the, um, <coughs> the uh, adolescent uh, intramural program at uh, NIMH. And with them, we're, we're now uh, just getting our uh, genetic information on this whole cohort uh, together to, uh, to give you more answers in that area we hope soon. <clears throat> so in the next slides, I'm going to uh, give you uh, some of the data from a, a, an article that we uh, came out just last month. Uh, Greta Winograd, who was a postdoc uh, of mine, now I'm happy to say an assistant professor with the Uni uh, State University of New York, uh, is the first author on that paper. And you have actually <laughs> A more, maybe a more thorough review of this paper in uh, the paper that uh, Alec uh, presented yesterday. And then he said, well, he wouldn't, he would skip over that section, but in your uh, handout, it's there. So you may look at it there. Um, what we looked at was well being over 20 years for those uh, uh, who uh, had adolescent uh, borderline disorder. Uh, 
and uh, here are, the, are some uh, examples of, of items in the uh, measures that we uh, used for that. <coughs> for peer support. I have one or more friends with whom I can talk about just about anything. The quality of their closest relationship. Uh, we comfort and help each other when we have troubles. And life satisfaction and self-rated physical health. So I'll just give you a little of that. I, um, adolescent borderline uh, personality disorder predicts 20 years later adult social support. And this is now uh, what you see, which is about a, uh, it, it would be called at least a medium effect size in social support over this trajectory from late adolescence to, late, uh, to the late 30s for people who had ha uh, been at the uh, diagnostic level in uh, the er early adolescence. Role functioning, which uh, improves substantially up to uh, sort of the late 20s and then levels off. It, the uh, downward curve at this, uh, at this uh, end it shouldn't be taken too seriously. <laughs> it's uh, how well a quadratic function will fit. And if we had a better measure of a ceiling effect, perhaps it would look like we're all getting worse uh, as we get older. Uh, and uh, but here you see, I would say a medium effect size uh, between those at the diagnostic level and the uh, and the average over this time. Uh, le relationship quality, and this was kind of a shock to me. For those who had the diagnosis when they were uh, at, were at the diagnostic level when they were early adolescents, there's actually a bigger difference from the norm that uh, over this period of time. Uh, obviously, what we were expecting and kind of hoping that at least these uh, these differences would get smaller. There is also a, a, a non-trivial difference in how they feel about their lives over time. That did not change over time. Uh, also here, I must say, the upswing in the uh, 30s is probably uh, also a, comp a, co a, a consequence of the limitation of our uh, quadratic equations uh, here. And adolescent... Uh, Borderline per, uh, personality di disorder also predicted uh, these are self ratings of physical health. We haven't done a full analysis of uh, which uh, health problems they have, although we have uh, data on that. Uh, one of the things I, I, I guess I should repeat is that uh, longitudinal studies give you a tremendous lot of uh, information to process over time, especially if you have a very rich protocol, which we do. And uh, so there's no disorder that we have completed all the analyses that we can see ought to be done. Uh, not, as you can well imagine, when we have assessments of all the Axis II disorders and all, pretty much all the Axis I disorders except for the very rare ones like autism for when we have no on, uh, no uh, absolutely clear cases, let's put it. So attainment and function 20 years later is clearly a problem for those who had these problems in early adolescence, in education, in occupation, in interpersonal relationships. There's a differential odds of poor function as uh, uh, rated by clinical GAF. There's differential odds of adult diagnosis. They get, uh, they are less likely, uh, about one degree less on an average at the average age of 33. Their uh, impairment is uh, reflected in their uh, self-report of functioning. The odds of being uh, severely impaired and in the GAF are increased on self-report uh, uh, over three times and uh, on the GAF uh, about six times. 
to say. <coughs> Increase of disorders for those with elevated borderline at age 14 of substance use is a little surprisingly small, I thought, significantly, significant but small, of uh, major uh, depression. Now this is of in the age, mean age 33 assessment in the previous year only. We're not talking about ever. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that has surprised me and, I'm, uh, and I think I mentioned earlier, we're now looking at our, our some of the common uh, comorbidity patterns. And one of these is definitely bipolar disorder. Another, uh, to my uh, surprise, in our data, as it was, as has been shown, in, as I said, in clinical samples, is in attention deficit disorder. Those are big risks. Those two disorders, in fact, in early adolescence, uh, are a huge risk. For, border, uh, for bipolar 20 years later. I mean for borderline 20 years later. So our developmental conclusions from the current data, uh, borderline symptoms vary over time. Persons seem when symptoms are particularly elevated will on average show lower symptoms in some <laughs> subsequent assessments. They are high when they are assessed in adolescence, suggesting an immaturity component that normatively declines over the development from childhood to full adulthood. Nevertheless, the functional significance of borderline disorder tends to persist over many years, regardless of age of first assessment. Where do we go from here? Well, we need to better understand basic biological genetic vulnerability to this very serious disorder. One of the adva other advantages of having a longitudinal data set, let me see, how, am I very close to my end? I've lost my time frame now that we did our coffee break. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of the uh, current things. Uh, uh, it, it, we haven't done the the biological, uh, the genetic ones, but one of the interesting things that we have uh, recently submitted for publications has to do with early separations from mothers uh, before age five, and these are um, a prospective uh, in the sense that they were assessed in that very first uh, assessment when uh, by mother report. And those are related to long-term borderline symptoms uh, significantly. And, uh, and so the question is, and I won't go into the details on whether this is attachment or not. It's not unambiguously an issue of attachment. Whether this is because the, this is not related to mother's illness. Uh, if that was the reason, then it apparently was a less risk. So it has something to do probably with uh, either the problems that mothers saw. Most of it has to do with being away for quite some time, being taken care of by grandmothers or other relatives, and um, the or husbands, and the. Uh, so this is this is one of the really interesting things we uh, we can't follow up anymore in in uh, getting how, you know, what, what all triggered that. We know the reasons they gave, uh, uh, but we don't know if these were very difficult children. We do not find uh, unambiguous temperament differences reported by mothers. Uh, we do not find, uh, fortunately, the original investigation included good uh, prenatal and uh, uh, and postnatal descriptions of the whole experience, pregnancy, uh, early childhood, and other illness experience. So it's, you know, we have still a mystery here uh, that our, uh, since we're very pleased with how much prospective data we have, but we need to uh, people to look at these at these issues. So. Uh, we do expect to find gene environment correlations. Uh, that this is this is where I think our genetic work has uh, throughout uh, 
psychiatry has taken us that it's, it's these combinations of vulnerability and uh, environmental uh, problems. Uh, so I invite you to uh, visit our website for more information about the study, uh, including our uh, methodology, bibliographies by subject and references for, uh, we're going, I guess we're going well over 200 now, <coughs> publications. So. Thank you. I'm not sure if I have time for questions. Was there a difference between ADD and ADHD in terms of being a predictor of bipolar disorder, of a borderline uh, disorder? Uh, I guess BPP, yeah. I have trouble now because BPD can mean borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder. In any case, the answer is I don't know. Uh, it's not that we don't have the data. I never looked to see whether uh, hyperactivity as such uh, predicted. Uh, in the, and the other problem was, of course, that we don't have a clear adult version of uh, ADD, uh, but hyperactivity I don't think is really thought of as part of the adult uh, diagnosis, and, uh, and I don't think we have a measure of hyperactivity in adulthood. Uh, so we had to uh, kind of make it up and take from the literature whatever we could. So uh, that's one of the issues in, uh, in adulthood. Are college students really adults? Well, or post-adolescents? Post well, let's see, you're younger than I am. You probably have some uh, in your family. Uh, I leave that uh, uh, judgment to you. I think they vary, as we all do. I think there are some uh, people who are adolescents who are pretty adult, and uh, I guess there's a variation in those. Uh, what was the cost of my study? In dollars. You know, I haven't I haven't assessed that, but it's expensive to do such a study, and that's uh, and that's a big means a big risk for us uh, uh, in continuing the study. Uh, uh, we took the same cuts, of course, everybody else did, uh, and it's gotten more expensive. Uh, as uh, well, no, I guess uh, I don't know that our co uh, as this fam these people now live in, uh, as I may have said, 40 states last count, and uh, some even abroad. Uh, we are doing uh, web-based assessments as much as possible uh, now. Uh, we can't go, and we did, we've had the best, I think one of the best uh, uh, records of keeping our sample. We have, by the way, the only loss that uh, uh, bias in our sample now is that men are less likely to agree to continue to uh, participate, but that's a small effect. We have no loss that's attributable to diagnosis, to uh, uh, SES, or to race. Uh, or uh, So sex is the only one we can find that's a difference. Um, over the years, well, the, the cost is, is I would, uh, maybe I'll figure that one day. You have to figure it all out for, uh, since this is over such a long time, uh, you would have to take inflation into account. Do we look at the influence of medications over the lifetime? We have uh, data on that, but we have not. Uh, other, uh, other than psychotropic medications, I don't remember if we have the data. I know we have the data on mothers, 
uh, on their mothers who are parts of, of, of uh, this study and associated study, but uh, I'm not sure uh, what we have on the youth. But it's surprising to us, as I said uh, early on, how few people are getting treatments of any kind, uh, really. Could I repeat what I said about the predicting chart? Ah, what I, uh, about uh, what I was trying to show you in terms of uh, standardized effects. I was just trying to, to say about whether those I'm not sure those effects were uh, how we should think about them in terms of uh, the kinds of effects we usually see in, in psychology and psychiatry. Um, I, if somebody has that question a little more, uh, if I've got it wrong, they can come up and, and talk to me. So thank you very much.